I used to think that grace didn't apply to me. I thought I could never be forgiven. I thought worthless was all I was. I used to think I could forgive myself. I thought I had to do better to earn grace. But I have been forgiven. I am accepted just as I am. I've been given a second chance. I am created with a purpose. Grace is a gift I didn't deserve. Grace is for sinners just like me. There you are. Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning. So uh, this is our next series coming up called Grace. Now, uh, there's always two sides of grace, right? And I think sometimes we forget about that. So the one side of grace that we've all come from at some point where uh, we've never lived the life that, that we're supposed to live and it comes to the place where somebody says that you could be forgiven and then you look over the past deeds of your life and you're like, mm. <laughs> I'm not real sure that those things could be forgiven. And so there's that side of understanding grace. And then there's the other side of grace, which is that sometimes when you're a Christian for too long, you forget about that grace when it comes to other people. Like, it's not that hard to remember it for yourself. You know what I mean? Like, you remember, like, grace for myself, but you forget how to extend grace to people. Uh, so in this next series, we're going to talk about both sides. What does it look like? Uh, to understand God's grace. What is it? And how does it apply to our lives? And also, as people who have been in the faith for a while, one of the things I think we need to make ourselves aware of is, is that sometimes we forget to ex extend the same grace that was extended to us through Jesus Christ to other people who aren't like us, who don't act like us, who don't do things like us, who don't understand us, and be able to share that love with them. So we're really excited about that series. It leads right up to Easter, which just a couple things uh, that you guys uh, need to be aware of. So Easter Sunday, uh, we're doing up here in uh, the sanctuary. Sometimes we go down to Champs and do it, which means uh, it's going to be really, really full. Um, so you guys that are coming to this service, keep coming, right? Because we, if you come to the middle service, people are going to be to the back wall and standing outside of the door. So we're going to try to encourage people to come to the, the first service or the third service to make room for guests. Uh, so if you're inviting people, uh, invite them to the first service or the third service uh, for you guys that already come here. And then we're encouraging people to come to the middle service to go to one of the other ones uh, to be able to make room. But we're excited about Easter Sunday coming up, uh, excited about the opportunity, because here's what we know, right? For all of our opportunities in the world, there are two times a year where people are more open to the gospel than ever. It's Easter and Christmas Eve, right? Those two opportunities. So use those opportunities as a chance to invite your friends and, uh, and so that they can hear the, the message of Jesus Christ and understand what that looks like. All right, so Bible for Grownups. Uh, we're wrapping the series up. So I'm sure for some of you guys, you're like, amen, brother. I'm glad that we're, we're done with the Bible for Grownups because the first part of it for, for some people in conversation has been really, really good. For other people, it's been, I don't know if I really understand uh, but I think today we're going to try to bring it all together, and hopefully some of the information that you heard um, over the past couple of weeks will now start to make sense. Uh, so if you haven't heard the first three weeks, you can go on to um, our podcast or onto our website and listen. Uh, go onto the app or go onto our website and listen to the podcast, or you can watch it, um, either one. But that'll kind of catch you up on what we've been talking about. But remember, this is why we did it. So the bottom line is this. We're hoping to reinvigorate you uh, in, a, in a place where you can get back into Scripture because we think that we've lost that. Like in our culture today, I think people have lost the love of reading the Bible. And I think it's for a couple of different reasons. I think some because people just didn't understand it, right? And so they don't get it. They don't know where to start. They don't know where to go. So that's why we did Bible reading plans. Um, so downstairs in the hallway, we have Bible reading plans for you, so all types. Because for some people, they're like, you know, all I saw was read through the whole Bible. Like if I looked at something, all I saw was read through the whole Bible in a year. And I tried to start that. And oh my gosh, I can't even make it. So we did a bunch of different ones, right, for you to try. We just want you to get into Scripture because we think it's important. Or you, somebody told you you should get into Scripture and you got the King James Version and you started reading it. And you're like, man, I want to read it, but I don't even know if I could read this stuff, right? Or you started reading the Bible, maybe it wasn't the King James Version, it's the regular Bible, and you're reading along, and you're like, I wonder what that means. 
but nobody was there to tell you. So we put uh, study Bibles and other types of Bibles down on that table too that will help you. So I, when you're reading, if you don't have anybody around you and you want to understand, these study Bibles will help you do that. Or if you read it and you're like, man, this doesn't read like a book. Well, there's a, a, a Bible down there that's called the story. And so when you read it, it reads more like a narrative of a book than it does whenever you're reading just scripture inside of the Bible. So lots of different opportunities. But our hope was that you want to get back in the Bible because we think scripture is important and we think it's important for your life. So Remember, the only reason we have it, so this is what the basis for everything we do, the only reason we have a Bible is because of Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. And people were so enamored, not only by his resurrection, but his reappearance, right? He just didn't rise from the dead and there was an empty tomb. He actually came back and showed himself to people. So the people were like, this has never happened. This is amazing. We need to write it down and we need to tell other people about it. So uh, the Bible or letters that became the Bible started because of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, all of that started in Jerusalem, but then it spread out to, like we told you, into the Gentile world, right? And when it went out into the Gentile world, the, pe the Gentiles, which were different than Jews, Jews were people who believed in one God, but didn't believe in the Messiah yet or didn't believe that he came. The Greeks were people who believed in many gods um, and, and had no idea what was going on in the Jewish world. So when they became Christians or wanted to investigate Christianity, they wanted to go back to the Hebrew Bible, which is our Old Testament. So if you're looking at your Bible, you know, our, it's together now, but it was never together before. There were some letters and then there was the Hebrew Bible, which the Jews had. So they would start reading it, and they read it, read it with a fascination of understanding who Jesus is and also um, how they would uh, understand God. Now, when they read it, it completely affected their worldview. That's what we've talked about for the past couple weeks of how the Old Testament changed the worldview of the Greeks. But now, this week, what I want to talk about is how do you figure out the relationship between the Old and the New Testament and how do we use it from an application standpoint so that when you're reading it, it makes sense? Because people have usually done one of two things when it comes to reading the Bible. They're like, the Old Testament, I'm not reading it, right? Like I read through it, doesn't make any sense, or things happen and doesn't apply to me, so I'm not going to read the Old Testament. Or I'm going to read it from a, I've got to follow the law of the Old Testament. Like people read it like that too. Or people are just saying, I'm going to read the New Testament and I'm not going to read any of those kinds of things. And so any Bible studies or anything happens, I'm not going to go to them if they have anything to do with the Old Testament. So I'm going to teach you today why they should go together, why they're important, and why Paul, who that's the, the major focus of who we're going to talk about today, why Paul said it was vitally important for us to understand the relationship and that we understand the underlying principle. That's the other key. So when you read the Bible, at times we get confused. And you usually get confused is because you're going in there to either look at it from a perspective that you want a question answered, like you're looking at it like I want this certain question answered, or you're going in it to prove your point of view, right? So I'm going to go in it, I'm going to find the scripture that, that uh, proves my point of view, and then I'm going to go show it to somebody and say, see, I'm right, you're wrong, you need to read this scripture, which isn't how we should read scripture at all right? We should read scripture from the standpoint of understanding the foundational pieces that go with that. So let's look at Paul first, because Paul is the one who then took the message of Jesus to the Gentile world. Now, you remember Paul being uh, first Saul of Tarsus, right? And he had two names for this reason. He was Saul of Tarsus because that was his Jewish name. He became Paul because he was also a Roman citizen, right? So he had two different names. Saul of Tarsus was the Jew of all Jews, right? He was somebody that uh, was raised up under the Rabbi Gamil. Now, the Rabbi Gamil was well known, so when, when Paul was raised up underneath him, he knew everything about the Hebrew Bible and the law, right? So he knew everything about it. So he's an expert in the law to the point where when Jesus Christ rose from the dead and in Jerusalem when they were talking about like people becoming Christians, once they became Christians, Paul or Saul of Tarsus said, they're, they're, they're not going by what the law says, so not only do I not like it, I'm going to go eliminate them. So he was essentially deputized to go out and kill Christians. So that's what he did. He went out and killed and persecuted Christians until one day he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. When he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he got saved. Once he got saved, he got a commission. His commission, go out and teach the Gentiles. Now, this is why this is so important. So an expert of the law, right, somebody who understood the Old Testament, goes to a Greek people and tells them Jesus Christ rose from the dead. They're excited about Jesus, but what else are they excited about? 
the Hebrew Bible, right? Who else better to help them understand how to use the Hebrew Bible right than somebody who was an expert of the law, right? So here was Paul preaching to Gentile people and telling them, this is how, when you're reading this, this is how you should apply it. So what you see in the 13 different letters that Paul writes about, he writes about just that. Like this stuff that you're reading, this is how it applies today. This stuff that you're reading, this is how it applies today. And he, and he wants us to understand this, right? That if you read the Old Testament, because I think if he were going to come up to you today and give you a Bible, right, and you say, now, before you start reading it, I want you to understand this. I think this is what he would tell you. Read the Old Testament for inspiration and motivation, right? That's what you should read the Old Testament for. And then read the New Testament for application, but read them both right? But when you're reading it, you need to read the, the Old Testament for inspiration and motivation, and then you need to re read the New Testament for application. Don't try to take Old Testament principles and turn them into applicable things for your life, because it doesn't work, right? That's not how it was written, and it's not the way it was supposed to work. In fact, if you look at, uh, Paul talks about this uh, to uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 6 through 11. So he's talking to the Corinthian church, and here's what he says to them about that idea, right? So they too were trying to figure it out. So remember the Corinthian people were Greek, interested in the Old Testament. So he's saying, okay, here's how you start to use those two things together. He says, now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. So when he says these things occurred, what do you think that they were reading? The Hebrew Bible, right? So they're reading the Hebrew Bible, they're reading through all of the stories, and he's saying these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. So he says, don't be like the idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. What story are they talking about? Remember Mount Sinai? Moses goes up on the top of Mount Sinai. He goes to get the Ten Commandments. He doesn't come down for a while. What do the people start doing? Indulging in revelry because they need something to worship. So he's saying don't be like that. So you see it's how it's tying together, how he's saying this is what was happening in the Old Testament. Don't be like those people. He says the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. Another story from uh, the Old Testament. We should not test God as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did. And they were, they were killed by the destroying angel. Anybody else be like, Ugh. You know, these, these stories where he's given us examples of all these things that happened. He said, don't be like these people. These were the consequences that happened in their life. He says, these things happened, right? Now he's bringing it all back into perspective. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as what? Yeah, warning, right? That's what he says to us. It's written down as a warning uh, for us whom the culmination of the age has come. What's the culmination of the age? Jesus Christ coming, right? So when Jesus Christ comes, he's saying, don't not read the Old Testament because the, the same God is in the Old Testament as in the New Testament. So don't just write it off. Like, you know, the, the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. You need to read it. And again, he's giving you these stories, just like what you do with your kids, right? You tell them a story of something that happened to you. Like, if you go out and do this, let me remind you of what happened to me. So if you go out and do it, like, this is what's going to happen to you. Like, we're trying to tell them, I want to give you an advance. Don't do that because it hurts. Don't do that. You might cut off your finger. Don't do that. This is why. Like, the same thing with the Old Testament. It's not made from its, essentially, like, apply it word for word. Like, it's not made to do those. It's made for you to say, the warning, like, don't be a grumbler. God doesn't like grumblers. Obviously, he destroyed him with the death angel right? Or everybody that's kind of taken sexual immorality as something that's not that big a deal in our world today. Like you can be sexually immoral and do whatever you want. Like he's saying, don't be sexually immoral, right? Those people, this is what happened to them. So take it as warnings, knowing that God obviously doesn't like those things. Now, is God going to destroy you when you go out of here today and grumble because your waitress didn't wait on you, right? Like that's how somebody want to apply, wants to apply it. Like it's got to be word for word, you know, you go out and if I grumble, oh my gosh, what's the death angels coming? right? Or if I sin, the snakes are coming to bite me. Or if I sin, I'm going to get sick and die, right? That's not what it was made for. Not application, word for word, apply to your life today, because it was the old covenant, right? It was the old covenant given to the nation of Israel for the understanding of how God was going to deal for the nation of Israel so that for this time, we, 
as Greeks can now look at it and see, okay, these are warnings for us, so we should look at it and understand it. Now, he understood it from this perspective too. So inspiration and motivation, but then from an application standpoint, he knew that there was a new covenant, right? He knew that whatever happened from this time on because of Jesus, the culmination of the age, would be what we should apply in his life because he knew this. This is found in uh, John 13, 34 through 35. Now, this would be something, like if you're not much of a uh, going back in and highlighting things or going back in and reading, this is one that you should mark in your Bible, highlight in your Bible, bookmark in your phone, whatever you need to do, because this is the foundational piece of what Paul draws everything on when we read the New Testament. He says, and this is Jesus, right? Jesus is in the upper room right before he's ready to die. They're, they're celebrating the Passover feast, right? So the Passover feast was, was, you remember back in Exodus when the death angel passed over? So every year they celebrated that the death angel passed over the ones that had blood on their doorpost. They're up there celebrating. Now, he knew that his days were numbered. So just like you would, right? If your days were numbered, what would you do? If you knew tomorrow was your last day, you would find your kids and you say, you need to know this and you need to understand this and you need to do this, right? So he's doing that with his kids, right? So they're in the upper room and he's given to them this last thing. Now, what he says is so profound because he says, a new command I give you. Now, if you were a Jew, right, sitting in that room, which all of them were, a new command I give you, what would be the first thing that would run through your mind? Like, what about all the other commands, right? What am I supposed to do with all of the other commands? Which is the part we're going to talk about later is how that relationship goes together. And so he says, this new command I give you, right? He says, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So here's what he's saying. You can look at and argue about and talk about and think about all of the commands and how they fit, you know, and how they're, they're, they're supposed to, to line up and how does it fit my life and what should I do with all those things. But if you miss this point, the foundational point, he says, new, a new command I give you. Love one another, not as they have loved you, which is usually how we love, right? Like you usually love people who will love you back. But he says, no, you love one another as Jesus Christ has loved you. Now think about that. Think about it from this perspective. What happened the next day? He started to put on a demonstration of love. What did he do? Went out to a whipping post, was beaten beyond human recognition, went on to a cross and was crucified for people who could care less about him. For people, remember the disciples? What did the disciples do whenever Jesus was arrested? All of his friends that he'd been with for three years, what did they do? Took off, right? They were chickens, right? They all took off. Peter, right, outside of when he's going through his trial, what did Peter do? He denied him. Like, I don't know who that guy is because he was afraid for his life, right? People who had been thronging to him, right? Remember this? He goes into Jerusalem. Everybody's putting down the, the palm branches. Hosanna, Hosanna. Those same people are now standing at the foot of the cross saying, crucify him, crucify him. His demonstration of love, he went to a cross for people who hated him. Now, <laughs> Putting this into perspective, I think, is so difficult because <clears throat> if you think about it, you're to love people like Christ loved you. And from an application standpoint, you know how difficult that is? Like I'm speaking from my own, you know, heart, how difficult it is to love people who aren't like you. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't want to get too, like, into your business, have, love people who have different political views than you right? Love people who do life differently than you. Love people who from a different social economic standpoint, right? That do different. I mean, think about this for a second. I mean, I think we live in a world and social media has exaggerated this. We're a lot of haters. <laughs> really? I mean, social media, you see this all the time. I mean, he says the world, the world who is looking will know that you're a disciple by your stance, on social media, by the scripture verses that you put out. You know, that's the other thing that's, that's always odd to me. We put out a bunch of scripture verses thinking people are going to know we're, we're Christians because we put it on social media, right? 
or by your church, like your organization, by your by your crap, by your cross on your church, by the way your steeples, whatever. That's not how the world's going to know you. The world's going to know you because you love people. Now, this is important. Love people who seem very unlovable. You know, I said this to somebody a long time ago. We have people come to the church all the time, and I said, if you're going to come to Life Church, here's what you need to get. We are on mission to reach lost people. So if you don't like them, don't come here. Because you realize that, there you realize that a lot of people don't like lost people <clears throat> because they're not like you. They don't talk like you. They don't spend money like you. They don't. So to reach those people, lost people, that means you have to know them, which means you have to go outside of your comfort zone, which means you have to do things differently than you're doing them right now. So I always tell people, we're a missional church. So if you're going to be here, I guarantee you won't like it. It, 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 because if you don't want to sit here and be comfortable with people who love you, we're telling you to get uncomfortable and love people that aren't like you, right? That's the whole idea behind it. Now, he gives us some application, so he says, put it into application, right? So this is what Paul does. So Paul, in writing throughout the, the, the New Testament, says, okay, so here's an example on relationships. This is found in Philippians 2, 1 through 5. He says, therefore, if, uh, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in his spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish amb ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humi hum humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as who? Jesus, right? Do you see how he's pulling that foundation back in? He's saying, you need to have the same mindset as Christ did. He loved people not because of them loving him back. He loved people regardless of who they were. So he pulls it in. And you can see this throughout all of scriptures. You know, the verses that talk about submission. So I, when I do marriage counseling now, I talk about, we bring it in. Hey, do you want to do the biblical version or do you want to do the, the worldly version? So part of the biblical version is understanding submission. And the girls are like, there ain't no submission going on here. Like, that's outdated. We're not talking about any of that. So, again, think about it this, from this perspective, because it's not just husband submit to your wife. It's, it's husband submit to, you know, Jesus, and really that you should submit to each other, that true love is, is a submission competition, right, that you're submitting. That's what true love really looks like. And what he's building a case for, when Paul talks about that, he's saying, if you would love each other, just think about this. If you would love each other, kids loving your parents, spouses loving, if you loved your spouse like Jesus Christ loves you, how much different would it look in your marriage today? If you served and did as Jesus did for you, how much different would it be? Because I know this, I've done enough marriage counseling and I've been married for 25 years. Sometimes it's conditional. Not for anybody else. You know, it's just for me. You know what I mean? You love conditionally. So as long as your wife does, then you're happy. So then when you're happy, you do the things that make her happy. But if she's not doing, or ladies, come on, if he's not doing, you know how to get to him, don't you? You know how to not make him feel loved, to bring him back and to wake him up. You know, what's he doing? He has no idea. I'm gonna, you know how to do that. But if, if we just threw those things aside and said, I'm going to love you regardless of you, you know what I mean? I'm going to love you regardless of all of your faults and all the things that are wrong with you. I'm going to love you. How much different would marriages look today? How much different would the respect level of children to their parents if they really took that under consideration? Right? That what does it look like to love your parents as Christ has loved you? Right? That he sacrificed and died and that you would think about, oh, what would it look like for us as parents to love our children in the same way? You see what I'm talking about? Do you see how that, those things uh, go together. If you think about evangelism, right? The same concept. If you love people like Christ loved you, then you would be talking to lost people because he talked to you. Somebody talked to you at some point. I don't know when it was. Somebody told you about Jesus or invited you to church, right? Maybe. Somehow you ended up here. Somehow you ended up knowing Jesus or somehow you got invited here. Maybe you don't know Jesus yet. Think about it from the same perspective. Who are you inviting? Who are you talking to? Who are you trying to bring into the same 
relationship with those things. So he says, from an application standpoint, that's the thing we need to understand. So when you read scripture, right, here's what you're going to see. Jesus said it, or you heard it said, this is what it really means. Paul says, this is what was going on in the Old Testament. Here's how to apply it to your life. So when you read New Testament scripture, you should read it with the foundational principle, love people, right, as Christ has loved you, and then this is how you do it in relationships, in marriage, in money, and right? You could just put whatever you wanted in there, so that's how the application happens, but it has to happen with the foundation being this, love, right? That has to be the foundation of relationships, the foundation of marriage, the foundation of money, the foundation of, of anything that you do has to be founded in love, and that we need to understand that. Now, he gives us another principle, and when he talks about this idea, so when he went out and talked to all of the Gentile world, he would say, so read Old Testament, now here's the application, so that's what you read now, here's the application of the law, but he also said something to him, that your life, because think about this, do you know how much time we spend in Bible studies, right, I mean, I hope you're spending some time in Bible studies, maybe you're not, I think you should be spending some time in Bible studies, but do you realize they didn't have a Bible to study? Like, what was supposed to be the gospel then? Like, they didn't sit there and be like, we're going to go through Philippians, and we're going to understand what Philippians says, and, and go through all this, and we're going to have a small group, and we're going to meet. They didn't have those things. And so he would say, your life, right, the way that you live needs to be different from the rest of the world. And you know what will make it different? He says, by your love and this. This is in 1 Thessalonians 4. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, but we do not want to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. Uh, sorry, I need to read it up here. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those uh, who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in him. Now, you're going to see this throughout all of Paul's writings. He says, people who have died have fallen asleep. Why does he say that? For everybody that sleeps, what happens? I hope this happens. What happens? You wake up, right? The whole idea of him talking about Christians falling asleep, for the people there, this was an amazing understanding. For all of those people, he was saying, listen, it's not that, that Jesus was just empty in the tomb. He defeated death, right? The, he defeated death. We saw him alive. So he... He said to every person, like, understand that, that Jesus Christ didn't just raise from the dead. He came back and he showed that if you believe in him, you can do the same thing. So for the people that had fear and death, because for a long time, I don't know if anybody else has this. Anybody ever in their life fear death? Nobody? A couple. So, yeah. So, I, like, for a long time, before I really got this concept in my mind, I was like, oh, my gosh, I I don't know if I want to leave, and I don't know if I've got everything done, and blah, 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 and I have this fear of death. So it affected the way that I lived, right? Like, it affected the things that I did. But people who don't fear death and understand that on the other side of that is eternity, and on the other side of that is a life that just gets to continue, you live differently than you do if you don't know that there's anything on the other side. And so he says to us, live your life as this that there is different than the world, you have an eternal hope, right? So you should live differently. You should mourn differently. You should spend your money differently. You should spend your time differently. You should do everything differently because of and in spite of eternity. Now, here's what I want you to see in all of this, because here's some of my fear. So my fear is this, right? My fear first is, is that people aren't getting into the Bible, right? Because he's saying, You'll be known, like, through the, how you love people. But if you're not in the scripture, you don't know how to love them. You just don't. I mean, that's what scripture does for you. Scripture gives you what you need to learn how to love people well, right? That's what it does, right, is, is it teaches you and motivates you to do that. So if you're not in the Bible, you need to get in the Bible. That's my fear. But you know what a bigger fear of mine is? is that way too many people are studying the Bible and not loving people. Like, that's my fear. My fear is, is that what the world has turned, like the Christian world has turned into, is just a bunch of writers writing books and Christians studying the books 
and their life's never changing. Right, like you're gonna, you, like you know way more than you did about a certain book or a certain topic or a certain thing, but the actions of your life do not change at all. In fact, I think that's the greatest obstacle for people of faith today. Jesus isn't the greatest obstacle. Like if they really knew about Jesus, you know, if people really knew about the Jesus that we know, or like what we're gonna talk about, if they really understood grace, who would not accept it? But right, if you really understood the grace that, that was given to, to all of us and could be given to all people, who wouldn't accept it? I think the greatest barrier is us, right? The greatest barrier to Christian faith is Christians who will choose to learn but never apply, right? Christians who will try to read the Bible, like I got up this morning and I read my devotions, and what? And what? I got up this morning and I prayed, and what? I got up this morning and I'm like, what did the Holy Spirit tell you to do today? I don't really know. Then are you listening? Because I don't, I just think that if you make yourself open, I think if you make yourself open, he's speaking. I think if you make yourself open, he's moving you. Because it's not like there's not something to do, right? It's not like there's not people to reach. It's not like that the, that, that the world doesn't need our love, don't you think? Right? Like the world needs our love, don't they? And if, they're, if we're going to be known by our love, we're not going to be known by our Bible studies. Now, listen, I want you to be in a Bible study, so don't take it that way. So I want you to be in that, but I don't want you to be in it for the purpose of you gaining more knowledge, but never changing your life. Does that make sense? Because when we read it, and as the worship team comes back up, let me leave it with this. When you read it, this is what I want you to, to understand. You can't read it, this is what Paul would say, without the underlying principle Love people like Christ loved you, okay? If you read it with that underlying principle and, and you're open to that, you can't read it without applying it. Does that make sense? Like if you read it from that standpoint to love people as Christ loved you, then when you read these things in here that, that tell you what that looks like, then it has to move you to apply it to your life, doesn't it? Like it has to move you into something. You're no longer gonna be able to read it and be like, that's some good information. You know, you know, I could quote that or I could memorize that or I could do that. You know, because if it was, Christianity wouldn't be known for our stances, which that's what we're known for today. Our stances, our organizations, our gatherings. But I'm not sure that we're known for our love. And I don't think we're known for our love because I don't think we're taking what this says and moving it out into our life. And so today we get to take communion because this is the other part that you need to remember. So he says to, the, to his friends in the upper room at the end of his life too, he says, you're going to do something. You know, and, and instead of the Passover feast, I want you to do this. I want you to take bread and I want you to break it. And I want you to remember my body broken for you. I want you to drink this wine and I want you to remember the blood shed for you. But most of all, I want you to remember this. In the coming days, I'm going to pay a great price for your life. A great price. Live a life worthy of the sacrifice. That's what he would say to him. You're going to see some horrifying things in the next couple of days. You're going to see some things happen to me that, that will never get out of your mind forever. When I, when I watch The Passion of the Christ, there's still things in my mind that have never went away. In seeing Jesus' crucifixion and seeing his beatings never went away from me. And he would say to them, I didn't do this for nothing. I didn't die for nothing. I didn't be beaten beyond human recognition. For I did it to purchase your life. And that you were bought at a price and we should live a life worthy of the price paid for life. And so as we take communion together, here's what I'd ask you to do. This is what scripture tells us to do. Take a chance to, to evaluate yourself where are you in this whole situation? Are you loving? Do people know you by your love? Do people know you by, by the way that you love them? Or do people know you from, for some other reason? What are you known for? Right? Think about that for a second. And think about this. Is our life, the way that we're living today, worthy of the sacrifice given? And if not, this is what he tells us to do. That's what's so great about grace. You're not going to have, the snakes aren't coming tonight to devour you, right? 
Not like we were saying in the Old Testament, grace abounds, right? Repent and grace abounds and start over and get on a new path. This is where he wants you to be. So as we uh, have this last song together, the communion tables will be open. So anytime that, that you want to come up and take communion, feel free to do that. doesn't make
it's pretty amazing, right? The thought of the extravagant love. Hard to imagine, hard to think of, but know that he gave it to each one of us and calls us to love in the same way. So that would be our challenge for all of you is to, as we read scripture, to love the same way that Christ loved. And don't forget that we have the resource center downstairs. So make sure in the hallways, so make sure you get a Bible reading plan if you're not on one. If you need a Bible, remember this. If you can't afford one, uh, we've had somebody from the church that said they'll buy anybody that needs a Bible a Bible. Uh, so just let us know either through your connecting card or let one of the staff know, uh, and we can get that for you. Uh, but just make sure you stop back down there and make sure that you get something to get you involved in Scripture again. Thanks for being with us. We look forward to seeing you guys next week.